Welcome everyone to Staying Ahead of the Curve, Know What the Library Offers You. We are here today to give you some library tips and to, to explain to you about the libraries. But before we do that, we want to introduce ourselves to you. Can everyone hear me okay in this room? And everyone online, welcome to the online people as well. So we have lots of folks here. So we want to introduce ourselves to you, tell you who we are. So I'm Rachel Bretas, and I'm a librarian for several humanities subjects and a couple of social science subjects. I'm basically a subjects librarian, and you will hear more about us later. And my name is Cindy Kotner, and I am the head of Access Services, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment. I'm also the librarian for students with disabilities and international students, among other, other units. So, okay, um, before we start, I just wanted a quick show of hands of who in this room is an undergraduate, graduate, and faculty. So undergrads, would you raise your hands? And people online, you can raise your hands too. Okay, great, great. Graduate students, okay. Faculty, anyone? Okay. All right. They'll well, regret it. They'll <laughs> they will regret. <laughs> so we have mostly undergrads and grads. Okay, that's good to know because I some of your privileges in in the circulation area are different for the different group. So um, let's go ahead. So what we're going to talk about today is. Um, I'm going to talk to you about what is Access Services and what kinds of things does Access Services do for you. Rachel is, is going to talk about your subject librarian. Everyone in this room has a specialized librarian for their subject area. Um, and then we're also going to finish with different spaces in the library, what we have and what, can, what, what you can make yourself available to. Okay, Access Services. This is I love the word access. The word access means to obtain, to retrieve, to gain entrance to. And so access services in the library are just those things. It, staff in access services include people who work at the checkout desk, the circulation desk. And might I say, I usually ask students, what do you check out at the library? Of course, books journals, but on a day like today, you might like to know that we have umbrellas that you can check out. You can check them out at Ellis and go to a, one of our specialized libraries on campus. We have eight specialized libraries and return it there. So we have umbrellas, we have equipment, calculators, laptops, um, chargers for your phone. So there's lots of things besides books that you can check out um, at the circulation desk. Um, other things that we have in Access Services, which we'll talk about, are interlibrary loans. So if we don't have the book or article that you want, we can go to other libraries all over the world and request that they send us a copy of something. <clears throat> and the last thing that is in Access Services that you might not think of but is very important is shelving. What do the shelvers do? We have people full time who shelve books. And in this building, if you have not had a tour of Ellis Library, um, you need to take one because in this building there we have the problem of having more books than we have shelves. So we have sh books that don't quite fit on the shelves and so we have places where we have overflow books and we're, we are working on that problem. But our shelvers work very hard to make things accessible that you can access and make things try as easy to find as possible. Okay, so let's, let's, oh, oh the, the course reserves. Yes, the last thing, part of circulation is course reserves. Your faculty, your, your, your instructors will often put things on reserve at the circulation desk, and that means it has a specialized checkout time, usually two hours or overnight. We have equipment that checks out maybe for 24 hours or for whatever period. We have books, we have one read, uh, books that are very, very hot on campus right now. Those books just check out for a shorter time. So books on reserve are another service that we have for, for students and, and faculty. Okay. So to find materials in the library, there are more than one ways to access books. This is from our home, our gateway page, and you can see that there are two tabs there, and the second tab finds books and media. And by media, we mean DVDs, uh, we mean uh, lots of other things besides books. So that is one way of looking for books. Let's see. 
And then the second way you can see the arrow is what we call our classic catalog. Our catalog has the name of Merlin. And Merlin is part of a larger system. In our library, um, the catalog record is set to search our campus called Merlin. Um, and, uh, but, but you can broaden out to something larger. And is that the next? No, it's not. Okay, okay. okay. But we'll go, go on down. Okay, so let's, let's talk about the larger in a minute. If you search Merlin, this is my, one of my favorite books to talk about, and you can tell it's right after lunch <laughs> for me, because this book is called Crunch, A History of the Great American Potato Chip. So let's say you wanted to check out this book. How would you do that? Well, as you can see, um, right here in this part of the, whoops, in this part of the record, it tells you that this book is not checked out. That's the first thing you want to know. <laughs> it also says over here that it's located at Ellis. So in addition to Ellis Library on this campus, thank you, Vanna, <laughs> Vanna White. <laughs> uh, Rachel, in, for those of you who can't see, Rachel is my um, cohort is pointing to the place on the, on the screen. Um, so um, Ellis Library, in addition to Ellis, there are eight other brand, uh, specialized libraries that have books. So you always want to make sure if you're looking in, for a book in Ellis that it does say MU Ellis. And then this is what we call the, the call number. And this is the, I call it the address of the book. This tells you where to find the book in the library. So, um, and if you actually, if it says MU Ellis, you can click on MU Ellis and pull up some maps, some floor, floor plans if you, if you want to. You can text this call number to yourself, or you can just take a picture of it or write it down on a piece of paper, the traditional old fashioned way. You can write the number down on a piece of paper, but then you, could, you would find in the library where that book is located and then go pick it up. Or if you wanted to, um, notice the, the golden arrow that says request a book. We have a relatively new service where our staff will actually pull the book for you. So if you want a book in our library and you don't want to get it yourself, you can request, you can click on this request a button and um, a form comes up and you can uh, ask our staff to do it. Now, is that going to be fast? No. It's going to take one to two days, maybe, maybe three days if, if we have problems finding the book. It would be much faster if you actually went into the stacks yourself and picked it up because you could do it immediately. Um, and I also encourage students that going into the stacks is kind of a good thing because you oftentimes accidentally find other resources on your topic that you didn't know existed, that you didn't find in the catalog. Librarians like the word serendipity, and that's a word that simply means I kind of accidentally found this great resource in the stacks. And um, so I always encourage people, if you can, to just go in the stacks yourself. It's faster. And you might find other resources right by the book you're looking for that will work very well as, you know, in addition to what you're looking for. So, but if you don't want to do that, you can uh, request a staff member to do that. And it will take one to two days, um, probably, maybe three. Um, we can also, with this, let's see the next one. Um, if, our copy of the book, let's say over here that the status said checked out and due back December 15th or whatever. So our copy is not available. Then you have the option of, of checking in the larger catalog. So I, I call it with one click, you can go from our Merlin library catalog to the, oh, sorry, Rachel. <laughs> Yeah, you can search Mobius right here. There's a button right here that says search Mobius. I'm circling it with my, with my mouse, um, the, the pointer. So if you click on this Mobius button, it searches about 70 libraries in Missouri that are mostly academic. And here, here is Mobius, uh, the, the map of Missouri and where all the Mobius libraries are. This is a free service, no charge, and it takes about three to four working days to get a book, but that we have actually couriers who drive between libraries. We don't even mail these books usually. We have couriers who drive in Missouri. 
So um, with one click, you can go from our catalog, Merlin, to the full Mobius uh, 70 plus academic libraries, mostly in Missouri. <coughs> So, um, oh, and one other thing I wanted to mention that is new, let me go back two screens to this one. Another thing with this request, but only this one, a new service is, we will actually, if you want only one chapter from a book, we will scan it and send it to you. So when you click on this button, uh, you have two choices and it says, do you want just a chapter? Do you want a full book? And if you want only a chapter, you'll probably get that very quickly because we will find a book, scan the chapter, and send it to you electronically. We have people who ask for more than one chapter. We don't scan more than one chapter for the same person. And the reason is we will just send you the book. So we will only scan one chapter. But if you look at some of the uh, records in Merlin, you can see the chapter titles and maybe you think, oh, I really want only chapter, I'm really only interested in chapter three. So we will scan that for you and send it to you. So that would be faster probably than, than waiting for the book. Okay, I wanna talk a little bit about articles. So articles, um, we have many, many, many electronic articles. So um, if you see this, find it, you will see as a student here, as a, as a staff faculty in our catalog, uh, and in our, our web pages, you will see this find it at MU button all the time. I want everybody to look at this button because I want you to, I want everyone to know what this is. I always tell uh, students this, this button is your best friend <laughs> because what it does, we, I call it a linker. It will link you, L-I-N-K link. It links you to the full text article if we have access to it. So um, it's great. So you don't have to worry about what resource has this full text. This linker will find it for you if we have access to it. So you can search all kinds of resources um, and you will see this linker button. And if we have access to that journal article, it will find it for you and it will find the full text. So this is just the greatest thing. This is wonderful. Find it at MU. Scan and Deliver is also an article uh, similar to book chapters. If you want an article in our library, we will scan it for you. And this is a relatively new service as well. We used to say to everyone, if the article is in our library, if the journal is in our library, you've got to get it yourself, period. But we have changed that policy and now we will scan an article for you even if it's in Ellis Library or the library that you are at located. So we will, you simply fill out a form, the interlibrary lo loan form, and we will scan it for you and get it to you. And sometimes this comes very quickly. I don't want to set unrealistic expectations, but sometimes it comes very quickly. Um, 24, 48 hours. Um, so, um, so that's a, another service that's relatively new, the Scan and Deliver. Have you, have you all seen the movie Scan and Deliver? <laughs> it's supposed to be a little library, kind of a library pun there. The, and the last thing on this page I want to tell you is the full interlibrary loan ILL at MU service. Probably most of you have heard of interlibrary loan. Most people, um, uh, know what interlibrary loan is. It's simply li libraries all over the United States have been borrowing from each other for years. This is a, 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 a classical um, service that libraries have. So ILL at MU is the name of our interlibrary loan service. And um, there are several ways that you can access it right down here under quick links. It says request an item. ILL at MU. There are other ways that you can do it as well. You'll find other links in our webpage. But, um, but interlibrary loan is a service that our staff will go and find libraries all over the world and request articles or books for you. I told uh, at a meeting this morning, we've had one student since for the last five, a graduate student who's requested over a thousand items through interlibrary loan. So that's in the, that's in the last uh, five or six years. So, and, and many of them are not within the United States. So our staff works very hard 
to locate, and if we can locate it, and if the library will lend it, we will, we will try to get it for you. And there's no charge usually to this service. So it's a free service for current students, staff, and faculty at Mizzou. Okay. Oh, I think it's ready for you, Rachel. It's Of the mic. Okay, yeah, a lot of a lot of people don't realize that we have subject librarians to where you know we have a certain amount of specialization by subject. And let me just explain a little bit about what we all do as subject librarians, or because a lot of people don't realize some of the things that we are able to do for you. Number one, um, we are partners in research for you. So there's a, a few questions. So if you start a question with which journal should I dot dot dot, what kinds of questions do you think might come up? Which journal should I, and you know, which academic journal should I? I can't see the online people. They might be coming up with answers too. But what kind of question might one have about an academic journal or which database should I? What might a person want to know of a subject specialist? Okay, yeah, which, which sources are biased? Like which journal should I trust is a, is a question that, that you can definitely ask the librarian and, and we would have answers for that, yeah. And, and there's a lot of reasons besides bias that you might trust or not trust a certain thing. Now, hopefully if something is a scholarly journal, it can mostly be trusted by definition, although maybe it's a matter of, is the subject that you're searching on something that's really in the, in the scope of, of what that journal does? But yeah, that's, that's one thing you might wanna know. What else? Which journal should I? Or maybe a broader question than which one should I trust is just which one should I go to or, or use? And also for, for the graduate students, especially among us, is which one should I publish in? Because you're probably going to, a lot of the programs want you to be publishing stuff but before you're done with graduate school. And sometimes it becomes a question, well, where, which journal should I send this article that I've written to? You know, because everybody's told me this is an article, you know, this, this project that I did but I'm not quite sure which journal would be the best one for it. We can advise on that. Another one is, I mean, which database, which database should I use? Because now some of you may not know what a database is, but in the library sense, at least, a database is kind of a package of information and it can do two different things. One, it, contain a whole, it can contain a lot of full text and it can be sort of tied to a subject for example, I'm the history librarian, among other things, and there are databases that contain all of these sort of scanned copies of historical documents, like from the founding of our country and, and just sort of things that would have been tacked up on, on trees and posts, you know, back at the time, and they've been saved and, and copied and so on, you know, that, that's one kind of a database. Then there's other kinds of databases whose main purpose it is to say, what's all been written lately in the world in this, sub in this particular subject. Like there's a chemistry database that just has kind of chemistry stuff in it. And it's very specialized and it only it has, you know, really pretty good top journals. Modern Language Association, MLA, is a database you may have heard of for kind of English and also other language kind of, you know, literature kinds of articles and stuff. So, you know, sometimes, I mean, sometimes searching something like a Google or a Google Scholar is okay, but sometimes those other databases can have very specialized ways of searching that can really help you narrow and pinpoint just exactly what you want and kind of leave all of the, the fluff out or 
you know, it, and it can be very good at kind of, you know, that, that issue of trust, the kinds of things that are indexed in those index databases to tell you what's all been done out there in the world about a subject, you can basically trust them. The only thing, then, then you're looking for that find it at a new button because those things are not there to tell you what's in this particular library. They're there to tell you what's been all published in the world. And then you're going to see the little find it at MU button that's going to connect you out to, or connect you in to us to, to see whether we have it, you know, either electronically or in print for that access again. So another thing that we do as partners in research is we create these subject guides that help sort of guide you along the way, even without making an appointment with you or whatever. We, this research by subject on the homepage there is going to get you to these subject guides. And here's a screenshot of an example of one that I did. I wrote the subject guide for primary sources, how to find primary historical sources. And I have it divided up by century. And, you know, not every subject guide is kind of organized the same way, but there's usually, not on the primary sources guide, but a lot of the subject guides, there's gonna be a, a space in there for what all databases are good for that particular subject. Which ones do you go to? first and so on. And then another thing that we do, this uh, we, before Cindy was talking about ILL at MU and that, you know, is self-serve kind of a thing, but the other kind of request an item that there is there, like you get choices when you click on request an item, one of your choices is request that the libraries purchase something. And I want every single one of you, undergrads, graduates, everybody to feel empowered to go ahead and especially if you can't find something in Merlin or Mobius and you know it's out there, your professor recommended it, you think it'd be a great book for us to purchase, use that thing. There's a little form that that will take you to and you can fill it out and say, hey, I want the library to buy this book on my behalf and I want the library to let me know when that book comes in and then I can check it out. I mean, we, we have pots of money to do that. So do make those requests. Now, if you make the request much later than about March, then we won't have the pots of money anymore. So <laughs> make them make them early in the year. You know, anytime this semester is probably pretty safe and early next semester. So feel empowered. You, you can go and request an item. And the person who makes that decision is, again, the subject librarian. And then, okay, so a few student perks. Um, when students want to make an appointment with us, you can view, you can plop yourself right into my calendar directly. If you look me up in the My Success Network section of your MU, of MU Connect, MU Connect is something that if you go into a Canvas page of one of the classes that you're in, there's a little starfish icon there. And if you go into the starfish, that will get you into MU Connect. Um, so, and once you're in there, yeah, you can go to My Success Network or there's within MU Connect, you can also kind of view all of your classes. And if you're not sure which librarian is associated with the subject for that class, if, if you go into your classes within MU Connect, not just in, I mean, not in Canvas, but like from a Canvas class, you go into MU Connect or you just go straight into MU Connect. And then within MU Connect, there'll be a menu that has, um, a place where you can view your classes in there. And then it's gonna have the people associated with that classes. This will also help you, at least with some of the professors who have got into the system, um, you can maybe make appointments with them in there and you can also definitely make appointments with librarians in there. And, and the great thing is then you don't have to be all emailing back and forth, like when's a good time to meet? It'll, it'll just plop you right into my calendar or whoever's that you're trying to get a hold of. So, yeah, and this is kind of what it looks like here. And within the MU Connect software, you're, you're looking at your course and there's a little icon over here that says, it's a little blurry on the screen, but it, it's got the MU Libraries thing and it says, schedule a research consultation appointment with Kimberly Muller. So it knows that for this class, because of the subject that it's in, it's, an, it's a library science class and Kimberly Muller is the librarian for library science. She's the librarian of librarians. Yeah, so that would, but she's also a few other things. Her social work class would be the same thing. It was a uh, women gender studies class that would also be Kimberly, so on. So you'll get an actual kind of beeline to the correct librarian, but you have to kind of go into MU Connect the right way to do that. And then, um, 
So for those of you, is anybody, any of the grad students here, are you instructors as well? Okay, yeah, I'll skip through this pretty quickly though. And, okay, so instructors can, you might end up having me as a guest lecturer at some point this semester. I've already got some classes signed up where I'm gonna be doing this, where I kind of show people how to do basics of, of library searching for that, you know, as it relates to that particular class. So we do that, we do guest lectures, we do, um, and then we do these course guides sometimes, you know, whenever a professor or an instructor comes to me and says, hey, can you make a special guide just for my course? Then if they do it, you know, a little bit ahead of time, then, then I can do that. And here's an example of one from my friend Noelle over at, uh, she's the engineering librarian and she's made this nice, very particular specialized little library guide. And she even has a little search widget in here to search this is one of these engineering databases. So if you're in engineering, then Compendix is the place to go. Nobody's born knowing that, but your, your librarian will know that. And, and if she's put together a, a class or a, a guide for your class, so much the better. Okay, and then library spaces. We have many of them. We have many libraries. This year, the building you're in now is the biggest library on campus. There are quite a few other libraries. Now notice this Daniel Boone Regional Library. I want to point that out. It's not a MU library. It is the public library, but it is a great place to go. It's the best place to go if what you're looking for is fun reading. Okay, I mean we got some things that can qualify as fun reading, but that's not as much our purpose, but it's totally their purpose. You know, if you want your genre fiction, you want, and, and they have, I'd say they have a better DVD collection probably than we do, although we have maybe more, I don't know. We, we both have DVDs, but, but they, have, they have that. They even, if you, and, and they're really good with letting students get library cards. You don't have to like permanently live in Columbia for the rest of your life to, you know, they, to have that. You just have to show your MU student ID and that will be enough to, to get you a library card over there. You, and that will also give you access to you know, certain eBooks, it'll give you access to a certain amount of, of video footage through Canopy. Like there's, there's a lot of things that you get from the public library too that you should totally use as students. But aside from that, we also have now, when you search the Merlin catalog, you know that location, it said MU Ellis. Well, sometimes it won't say MU Ellis. If you have a book about cats, it'll probably say Vet Med Library, which means it's over here. And the good thing about the Vet Med Library is there's ice cream nearby, mm -hmm. so go there, and especially in the summer. And then there's the Journalism Library, which is nice and new and renovated. They're the library that has the moving shelves, like you press the button and the shelves move, you know, the compact shelving, because they have really thick, heavy floors that can deal with that. Our, our floors here are a little bit too old and delicate, so we we, they can't handle the weight of those, but I always have this great respect for the journalism library because they have that. And what else to say? Like geology library is a really cute little library in the geology building. It seems like all these um, specialized libraries, they, they tend to be on the second floor of whatever building they're in, just a little tip. They're always on the second floor, which is good. Because that means, you know, if, it, if there's some massive flooding or something, it usually, usually doesn't hit them. Um, yeah, there's a law library, which is a little bit outside of our system, but occasionally you'll run into things. They'll have a video that you as a non-law student will not be able to use. That's kind of the one sort of restriction. Most every other library in every other situation will, you know, lend books back and forth in a problem and, and, and that. Let's see, the, the health sciences library is open a little bit longer hours than us certain times a year because those medical students just never sleep like ever. So they, you know, stay. Although actually, now that we're open 24 seven, I'm not sure they can say that anymore. And, but there might be, well, there's some parts of our intercession where we, we re restrict hours a little bit, but, um, but, and then at those times, maybe they can still claim to be open longer than we are. But anyway, they're down there. And if you, if you, if you happen to live down there, certain frats are over this way and stuff, there's nothing to stop you from studying the, in the health sciences library, except those medical students do want it super quiet. So they will be known to, if somebody's making noise in there, they don't like it. But it's not the librarians that shush you over there, it's, it's the students. Anyway, so um, yeah, speaking of shushing, you can see you know, librarians, we get shushed more than we shush, honestly. Um, just, putting that out there. We, 
we have zones and if you were to go to that URL there, you would sort of you'd see a, a whole discussion and a whole map of where the zones are, but just realize and this library here, it's a big library down on the first floor. It's much more the service area and the group study area and the more social learning space. So it's in the first floor from this floor here on up. It's much more quiet. Um, this is where you're going to find your, your quiet study spaces. The further up the building you go in general, I would say the more quiet, like across from us right over there is this big giant study room and it's quiet. Like, and people all the time, somebody come, comes into our online reference and says, like, somebody's talking or somebody, somebody's on a phone, blah, 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 blah. And so, and then we have to send a guard over there to like go and we have the guards go look at them. And then, and the quiet then, but that's not done on the first floor. If they say they're on the first floor and that's happening, we're like, oh, no, <laughs> you're, you're allowed to talk on the first floor. So, um, I said, well, there's there's one quiet space on the first floor, but it's marked really clearly. Anyway, um, yeah. So, student perk: you can reserve a study room. You cannot reserve a study room every Tuesday at 7 p.m. because there's too many students to do that. But what you can do is you can you can reserve this Thursday at 7 p.m. for you and your chemistry study group or what have you. And and the, and you can do that for blocks of up to two hours at a time. And clever students, I will not endorse this practice, but sometimes if you have a group of five people, then each of those five people can make their own reservation. But once you have a reservation in the system, you can make it out as far as you want to, but you can't have any other ones until that one has happened. So bear that in mind as you think strategically about reserving study rooms. And there's a link right off the home page, kind of toward the lower right corner of it to, to do that reservation. It can be done online. You can see the schedule of when the, book, when the rooms are available. And, and also some of the specialized librarians or libraries also have study rooms not just this building. So even if it's a building you don't go to that often, if they have an open study room, I mean, they'll let you in. They don't care what your major is or anything like that. So graduate students, oh boy, lucky you. These cages here are for you. <laughs> it used to be just people working on their dissertations could get them. It sort of uses the monk's cell sort of concept of a library like keep me away from my online distractions and give me a little space where I can just put my giant stacks of books that I'm studying or that I'm using for my dissertation, you know, my, my 1,000 interlibrary loan books that I've borrowed from other places. I can just stack them all up in there and then I don't have to carry them back and forth because, you know, back at home, I got my dog, my kids, my three roommates, and I just want a spot where I can just study. Graduate students can get those. They're called study carols. Some of them look like cages, a few of them don't, but, but they're all lockable and they're all you know, safe to put your stuff in. So it's a thing. Uh, and then also since part of study routines tend to involve people occasionally needing to use the restroom, we do, we have a new thing, fairly new. How, how, when did that start in all gender? Two years. Restrooms? Two years and then we went updated. Okay, yeah, so now we have two all gender restrooms and they are on, they're just kind of on this floor, there's one a little ways down the hall that way on the left, and then kind of directly above it, two floors up on, on fourth floor west, or on kind of third and a half floor. <laughs> the, the floors in here are kind of confusing. You get out the elevator at three and it puts you on what I call the third and a half floor because it's the hallway directly above this one and, and it kind of goes up past flights of steps on each side to fourth floor east and fourth floor west. And then there's on the east side, there's a half flight that goes down to get to the actual third floor. That's what you get when you come out three at the elevator. Little trick, three R on the elevators means three rear, like the rear door of the elevators. In case you wondered what that mysterious R was all about, it just means the elevators have a rear door and a front door and the, the front door puts you out in the hallway and the rear door puts you out right directly in the book stacks. And by book stacks, we do not mean physical stacks of books, although I suppose that would be overflow. Who knows, pretty soon we might have physical stacks of books, but right now we, I mean, and it's happened in the past, but not in my time. And, um, but we, it's just a term that we use meaning like the, the large bookshelves. That's what we mean by the stacks of checkoutable books, kind of. And so coming back down from these upper floors where the stacks are, 
See, the upper floors are for books and quiet study. The lower floor, the first floor, and the ground floor really is, is for less quiet stuff. The, the first floor, I mean, we sort of set the tone of, you know, you don't want to be yelling and screaming on the first floor. The quiet talk is perfectly acceptable. And it's really a people space. It's a space for people and service points and, and computers. And so here's um, a map of it. And by the way, this lower part, the green part on the map where it says writing tutors and on down this whole sort of lower half, that part has no upper floors. That's why the first floor is really, really big. And these upper floors, they're just kind of covering this, this north or top part on the map. And that's important because this elevator here doesn't go very far. It just goes from the ground floor around the bookmark cafe and restrooms up to the first floor. And so that's important when you break your leg when you're playing lacrosse the first week of school or whatever, and then you need to suddenly, you know, think about where the elevators are because now you're on crutches and you don't want to mess with the stairs. So that elevator there is just the one floor elevator and it goes down to the ground floor where this bookmark cafe is down there. And other than the Bookmark Cafe, there's not that much that you would actually need at this point. There's gonna be a lot of, State Historical Society occupies a lot of the rest of the ground floor and they're moving out and who knows what's all moving in, they're still figuring it out, but whatever. Also the um, Ellis Auditorium is kind of ground floor, but you have to go out of the building to get to it. So ground floor, there's not much library stuff in there, but there is the cafe. And it's sort of the floor that you enter on if you come in the west entrance. If you come in the north entrance up here off of um, Lowry Mall, then you're coming in at the first floor. If you're coming in the west entrance, you're coming in the floor lower at the ground floor, okay? So how many of you came in the west entrance today? Speaker circle entrance. Anybody? Not too many, just a couple. Okay, or you're not sure. <laughs> Um, yeah, if you went up this giant terrace, uh, flight of steps inside the building, you came in the west entrance. If you went up a giant set of stairs outside the building, you came in the north entrance, okay? North entrance is where the big outdoor impressive looking entrance is. I came in for my job interview that way and I was just like, oh my god, no, <laughs> this is scary. So yeah, the north entrance and circulation and reserve, you know, these access services that Cindy is in charge of. And interlibrary loan, all those offices are up here. So it's service points. The one quiet area in the in this floor is this room 114. It's a it's a study area. But we have public events sometimes in this 114A area. So sometimes there'll be unusual stuff going on. But let's see. But the importance, oh yeah, this new thing this semester is the digital media lab, which is open from 10 to 3 in room 156. It's so new, there's not really a label for it on the map, so I'm putting one there on the slide. Um, just know, if you, if you ask at the reference desk in the information commons, then they will, if you ask for the digital media lab, they'll, they'll point you to the right place. And that's a new thing. I mean, that's got stuff like 3D cameras where you can, if, if you know, there's an exhibit that's, that's in the colonnade right now that has got students' heads in it that we scanned with this 3D camera, and then we printed it out on 3D printer. So you, you can do that kind of thing in the digital media lab. and and occasionally people ask for like, they're having a job interview and they need somewhere to, to do that. And they actually, I mean, it's not really for that, but if, if that area is free, then, then they can let you use that digital media lab for that too. But there's a lot of little kind of newer technology sort of things that, that you can experiment with in there. So they're pretty cool. Um, and the writing tutors take up residence in one of our group study rooms. Most of the rooms are reservable directly for students, but the writing tutors, we just let them sort of take some space and there, and, and you can walk up to there and, and sign up for their hours. And our uh, research library and offices are down over here at the end of the information commons. So let's see, what are we looking at? Oh, I've got no idea what time it is. Okay, good, I got time. All right. So, okay, so we got the elevators. There are these two elevators here. This is the ones I was talking about with the front and the rear exits and entrances. They, they sit like right over there outside the room. And the room we're in now is on the second floor, so it's not on this map, but it's located roughly kind of where it says newspapers here. It's kind of about there on this map. Let's see, if you ever want a job in the library, you go walk over to an administrative office, or actually there's a, a spot on better, there's a spot on the website where, where you can go and 
apply for a library job soon there. Let's see. Oh, the bird exhibit. <laughs> That's all gone. We sold the birds. No more birds. But yeah, now it's, it's exhibit space for our wonderful special collections, and they're setting one up. So look out for the new exhibit coming down, new special collections. On. I'm not sure what it's on. But that reminds me, speaking of special collections, if anyone's on Instagram, I suggest you subscribe to the Instagram feed for our special collections because you will get postings like this lovely thing. We are bound for the weekend in sumptuous style. This little purple velvet Bible was presented to Josephine Bonaparte Bolton of Jeff City, Missouri, 1831. And that's not even anywhere near the oldest thing they have in there. It's just really pretty. But they always, on their Instagram, they'll, they'll just now so treasures. And it really is treasures. I mean, that special collections, it's up on the fourth floor for a reason because they are like, the king. I mean, they are, when it comes to treasures and museum-like things, you know, objects like this that are rare, that are unique, that are, I mean, like, you know, when I buy books as the history librarian, I'm mostly buying books that are published and I can replace them if somebody's dog eats them or whatever. The books like that in special collections obviously don't check out. They're super careful about them. You have to follow museum-like rules. And like, if you ever study abroad in another country and you use some of their ancient libraries in those other countries, that this is sort of practice for that. You will, um, you'll encounter rules like, no, you can't have that pen in there. No, you can't have that backpack. You must put it over here so that nobody just acts it. Because, you know, things happen. They don't think you're necessarily a thief, but they don't know who's a thief when they go in there. So they make everybody put away things that would make it easy to steal stuff from them or mark stuff or accidentally mess with the stuff because it is unique and it is really amazing museum-like content. And the great thing is some of our courses here at Mizzou have integrated some of those special collections in there. I mean, they have all kinds, not just rare books like this, but they've got old maps, they've got Gosh, they, they even have, and my favorite thing in there is their oldest thing, which is a, a goat receipt. This is like from, from ancient, what's now Iran, where they, uh, it, I mean, it's, it's in Cuneif, or it's in some sort of, I forget of it, Sumerian, yeah, it's Cuneiform, and, it, and they've, they've figured out that it basically, that one of the one of the one they have several of these little tablets and it's kind of a receipt for this person brought this many goats to the temple to be sacrificed for such and such and it's and, and they have it in this beautiful little case it's just this little thing and the funny thing about it provenance wise i was told once by one of the special collections librarians that the as far as they can tell the people didn't actually intend to to preserve that thing it was it and a bunch of other little things like it were, you know, little clay tablets were kind of thrown in the pile for we're going to throw it away. But then, and, and the ones that they wanted to keep and preserve were baked in the ovens and to, you know, to make the, to, to harden the clay into real pottery so that it would really last. So that was going on, but then there was a fire and all the ones that were kind of just in the trash heap ended up getting baked. And the ones that were had been baked ended up getting destroyed in, in some way in the fire. That was, I, I hope I had that story more or less right. But, but there's definitely a, a, some component of it that has to do with sort of what gets saved. Sometimes it's on purpose. Sometimes it's accidental. But at any rate, that is. I mean, anytime you want to see the cuneiform tablets, you let them know a little bit ahead of time. They'll pull it for you. They're happy to do that. They love to share. Their treasures. They have the strict rules, but don't let that intimidate you at all. They are really nice up there and they work really hard to make sure that you, the students, have access to seeing these, these amazing things. You know, anytime you just need a little perspective on life and various problems and, and so on. When I just feel like, you know, this too shall pass and I want to see something that totally isn't from my life right now, go up there. So, that's, so I guess now we can go ahead and, oh yeah, I guess before opening it up for questions, I'll just reemphasize, you know, you can go through and get directly into our special, into our librarian calendars through MU Connect, 
And we also, of course, have off of our homepage, there's a, a directory link on there, and there's several tabs to it. This is has to be complicated, but there, one of the tabs is for subject librarian, and you can identify your subject librarian there and um, get and, and get to a page that's got their contact information. So, you know, we're always fine with having walk-ins, we're all fine with you know, calls, emails, whatever. And and the MU Connect thing just takes a little bit of a guesswork out of it as to whether we'll be here at any given time. A little bit of a change this semester um, at, the, at, the, at the reference desk, sometimes you will still see uh, an actual research librarian at that desk but more and more, especially during the day, it's gonna be a little bit more like a concierge kind of a model. The people there are gonna be trained to answer like real basic directional kinds of questions. But as soon as the question gets to be a bit more subject specialized, they're gonna refer you to the subject librarians or, you know, or depending, you know, to, to other parts of the library. And, and that's, it's gonna be a little bit more like that in the, in the future as we, have some staff cuts and we have to get creative a little bit about how we staff the services but um but we are definitely there for you even if we're not always sitting right out front and we very much welcome by appointment or even walk in if you get lucky so any questions or any you know or if you're coming from experience with other libraries are there like services that you're aware of from other libraries that you want to know if we have it here or any of that Oh yeah, let's see. I should also mention, you know, the, the specialized databases like the, the MLA and the, and just the, the ones for, for finding good scholarly articles and subjects and stuff, those, um, you can get to them from off campus, but you will usually be asked to log in as a Mizzou student. And, you, and to get to them, you always want to go through the library homepage to get to them like there's there's some of these ones that have sort of brand recognition out outside of just our library like many professors will have heard of jstor and they'll say go find this article in jstor and you can go to jstor.org but the thing is from jstor.org you don't necessarily they're not going to know that you're going to be trying to log in as a mizzou student in particular so it's better to go to, instead of going to say jstor.org, you wanna go through our homepage and go to where the databases are listed and, um, and look up JSTOR in there and go in that way. And then JSTOR will know to direct you through our login so that it will, it, it kind of directs you to the, to the keyhole to which you have a key. So, or to the wise there it wears our catalog and merlin catalog anybody can use that from anywhere it, you only the only time you'd be asked to log in for merlin should be is is if you go to an ebook and those are you know ones that we purchase and if you if, if you see an ebook link you want to make sure that it says mu not umkc or some other library in missouri because those ebooks are by contract so you know if i buy a book <laughs> And it's an ebook, then all of my people can have it, but all those people over at UMKC don't because the contract has to do with the number of students that are currently at Mizzou. That's kind of the, the base of that. Because otherwise, one library would get an ebook, and then all the students in the world would get access to the book, and all the publishers would go broke and die. So they don't. Um, and so also, I wanted to um, make sure everyone knew that starting Tuesday after the Labor Day holiday, do you know how many hours Ellis Library will be open? Well, we're open 24-5 starting next Tuesday. So right now, the last two weeks of class, we've closed at 2 a.m. But starting Tuesday, um, the library is going to open at noon on Sundays and will not close until midnight Friday. So there's just a few hours on the weekend where Ellis Library will be closed. And also, one of the ways to contact us is through our chat service. And our chat service is open even more hours than Ellis Library is. I think, I think it's only about 14 or 15 hours in the entire week when chat is not available, the chat service. So if it's 3 o'clock in the morning and you are not wanting to leave where you are to come physically, to Ellis Library because it, it'll still be open at three in the morning. 
you can you can do a chat and there will be someone there to to help you and if that person who answers cannot help you because that person may not be one of our librarians we contract out after 5 p.m but they will be able to, <laughs> they will be able to uh direct your question the next day to a librarian who's here so uh, but they may be able to answer it as well but i just want you to know that there are a lot of service points that you can contact us and if if Anything that, if I could say, if of all the things that Rachel and I have said today, perhaps the most important thing is contact us if you have a question. And if you don't know who to contact us, it doesn't matter. Just get to the library page and click on the contact us or the little page that the little side window that pops out. You can chat, you can email us, you can text us, you can call us on the phone. Um, there are ways to contact us and we will put you in touch with the right person. So I think that's maybe the most important thing for you to remember is just contact us and we will get into, we will, we will connect you with the right person. So any questions at all? Oh, so we are your guides to the research ecosystem, the, the publishing world, the academic publishing world. This is a new world for many of you. So, you know, it is absolutely not cheating to come to us for help. If you are stuck in any way, you know, any paper you have to write, we've got to do outside research, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah. You mentioned how awesome this tour is. How oh, that, you know what? Now, now it, it's actually a smartphone thing. You must come physically to the library. And there is, I think we still have the print version of it too, that if you, if you come to the, to the reference desk, they'll be able to hand you a print version if you don't have a smartphone. But on the smartphone, it's like a basically a scavenger hunt. It's kind of like, okay, here's where you go to do this, and it sort of brings you over there. Now, once in a while, I mean, Mike Muchal, the architecture librarian, has occasionally done these things where he'll sort of do like an historical tour. He'll be like, yeah, this stairwell used to be. You, you could, it, before it got walled in, it used to look like this in the past. And they actually have some of the pictures of that online too. So nice to see that. If, if you go to our website and up at the top right, there's the gold, I call it the golden search bar. It's our library site search. If you just type scavenger hunt, it pulls up where you can take the scavenger hunt, the, the link. Or, or if you, we also have a virtual tour. You can put virtual tour up here and it will, you can take a virtual tour. Not as well. Yeah, the yeah. scavenger hunt is a lot more fun. Yeah, do the one where you gotta be in the book. Yeah, that's more fun. Question? From is there full text printing from the databases and journals? If so, is there a cost? Is there full text printing from the databases and journals? And if so, is there a cost? Yes. There, there is full text printing. If um, you click on the Find It at MU and it, and, and it will pull up the PDF, you can, you can pull up the full text article and you can print it. It's only a cost for your printing. So if you're here in the library, it would be five cents a page and it would be charged to your account. If you're not in the library and you print it off, it's whatever charges are associated with your personal printing. So there's no charge to the database to print it off. It's only the the printing costs that are associated yeah. with being in the library. Yeah, it's the same thing as printing out a Word document. I yeah. mean, printing is different from getting full text because some databases are all about their full of full text and they have nothing but full text. Other databases, their whole point is just to say, this is what's been published. We're just going to tell you about it, but they might not have the rights to the full text. But that's when you click on the Find It at MU to see if we maybe have the rights to that full text from somewhere else. And then it will connect you to that full text. And so not every database has a lot of full text, but just because you don't find full text in that database doesn't mean you don't have full text. You follow the Find It at MU button. It'll get you hopefully to that PDF someplace. And if we don't have it, we know that we've got the, the scan and deliver available in interlibrary loan for, for articles. And interlibrary loan goes really quick for articles because it's generally all online. And it's no charge. Right. No charge for no that. charge for that part. Yeah. So it's kind of two different questions. Printing is one thing and getting a hold of the full text from someplace or other is, is another kind of a thing. Have to be separated. Good question. Anyone else have a question? 
Well, we hope to see you often in the library, either studying or retrieving materials or whatever. Uh, it's a great place to be and um, hope you have a great semester. Yeah. If you're looking to do some writing, come later to our bibliographic management tool from uh, these Fridays at the library series. We have quite a few. Yeah, yeah, check our schedule for the, this is the big general one, but there's going to be a lot more in-depth uh, coverage throughout the semester.